Yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, he comes from Rice University. At least that's where he's teaching now. He's come from many, many, many other colleges and very, very educated. And he, he has, as just as our last speaker, has a great perspective to share. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Anthony Pitt. Well, thank you for hanging out. There are a few things I'd like to say, but then I'd like to leave uh, time for discussion. First thing, although you should know it, you may not. I come from a rather proud and long line of humanists, atheists, free thinkers, and skeptics. In fact, this community of which I'm a part is older than the black church that tends to occupy so much of our time and attention. Black churches began to develop institutionally around 1750s, but as Africans step off the boats, they begin to develop the blues. Don't think about 1920s race records. The blues, much older than that, they develop as the spirituals are beginning to develop, and as the spirituals look to something bigger than humans to try to make sense of what seems an absurd world, blues look to us. They take the light in the physical pleasures of life. Don't look beyond what the senses tell them. But humanism and atheism within African American communities continues to move, it continues to develop, it expands way beyond this musical tradition. Whereas some enslaved and free Africans are moving into churches for a variety of reasons, a variety of reasons, you have other African Americans who want nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. And this is in the historical record. There's a minister who's rather well known and popular within black Christian circles, Daniel Alexander Payne, who laments this development. He says, look, the problem with slavery is it's perverting minds. It's turning people away from an ability to embrace something larger than humanity. That slavery is turning people into atheists. And he says, I'll give you a personal example. I'm chilling, going about my business, preaching, and I stumble across a young man and I ask him uh, where he's from. He tells me the plantation and I ask him if he's a Christian. And he looks at him and says, no. As long as this is taking place in the world, we can't be Christians. As long as this is taking place in the world, there can't be a God. I'm part of a long line of humanists, atheists, free thinkers, and skeptics that goes much further back than you might believe. This develops. It continues to move and probably hits its high point in the Harlem Renaissance. The writers begin to argue that it's time to move away from the typical way in which we thought about things and it's time to understand African Americans as fully human because they are capable of doing great good and they're capable of doing their share of shit. This is what makes them human. All of this needs to be documented and presented. They provide a different spin on some of the older literature. So they rethink Frederick Douglass. Because Frederick Douglass, against his own inclinations, had been turned into a Christian. But if you think about the transformative moment in Frederick Douglass's life, it's not going to church, it's not hearing anything about God or anything about Jesus the Christ. For him, it's a fight in a barn with a man named Kobe. He argues that his slave owner was trying to break him and had given him over to this man, Kobe, who was known as being a tremendous slave driver destroying the will of enslaved Africans. And Frederick Douglass argues it looked as if he was going to surrender as well. That he was having a difficult time because of Kobe distinguishing between his condition and his personhood. Having a difficult time understanding himself as anything other than a slave. But then one day, 
after one too many beatings, he meets Kobe in the barn, and they go at it. They go toe to toe. And Frederick Douglass is giving as good as he gets. And Kobe calls for another slave to come in and handle <coughs> Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass hits him, slave backs off, and it's Kobe and Douglass. And they're going at it. Going at it. Kobe finally stops, and Frederick Douglass says that Kobe never bothered him again. And Frederick Douglass tells us in more than one of his autobiography is that it was at that point, at that point, that fight with Colby that he realized he was human, hmm. fully human. He didn't attribute this declaration to God. He attributed it to two humans going at it in a bond. Harlem Renaissance gives us a different way of thinking about some of these figures. Richard Wright, one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite authors. If you've not read Richard Wright, put him on your summer readings list, and you'll email me and thank you. Richard Wright argues that his grandmother wanted to bring him into the Christian faith, that she tried really, really hard, and when she couldn't do it, she turned his friends on him and tried to get his friends to bring him to Christ. And he says he went to church. Right? He tried to make his grandmother happy. He went to church, and, and he says in his autobiography that going to church wasn't so bad because the preacher's wife looked pretty good. <laughs> and if nothing else, it gave him an opportunity to see this beautiful woman. And the music was nice. Right? He could get into the music while he was in church, but he said anything deeper than that, any kind of commitment beyond that was impossible for him because he had encountered the world before he encountered this stuff in the church. And that the rawness of life was more powerful than the fantasy of the church. He couldn't buy it. A buddy of his, James Baldwin, in his autobiography, Go Tell It on the Mountain, tells a story. He becomes a minister. Young man, young man becomes a minister. He's pretty good at what he does. When he reflects back on that some years later, he says, look, I had to leave it. But at that point, it made some sense to him. Growing up in Harlem, he argued, you had to belong to something or somebody. You had to belong to something or somebody if you were going to maintain anything of life's integrity. He said he could belong to the pimps, he could belong to the drug dealers, he could belong to the church. And this Pentecostal church for him seemed a better option. But he leaves it. Zornel Hurston tells us wonderful stories about voodoo and conjure. Right? As an anthropologist, she's into this. But she also argues that she understands prayer as the cry of weakness. People pray to God because they're unwilling to take upon themselves responsibility for who, what, when, where, and why they are. So they call out to God. Without A. Philip Randolph, you have to rethink the march on Washington, right? You have to kind of rethink economic transformation without A. Philip Randolph. And A. Philip Randolph really wants nothing of the church's theology. For him, it's much more pragmatic. He gives a little money to the church because the church was a profound organizing opportunity. There wasn't another organization in African-American communities that could gather so many people and get information out so quickly. So it was worth a little money. But personal engagement? No. Some part of this long legacy, this robust and long-standing community of humanists and atheists. And I used to think, well, that should be enough to get African Americans included in the meta-narrative of our movement. Right? That this long <coughs> legacy, figures that people know, should be adequate to get us included in the meta-narrative, as opposed to the nice, polite footnote. It really hasn't happened the way I thought it might happen. Right? It really hasn't happened the way I thought it might happen. And, and it seemed to me in part because you don't know our stories. You know Frederick Douglass. 
you may have heard of Richard Wright. Some of you may claim President Obama. I don't know. <laughs> but you really don't know our stories. So this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to tell you a little bit of my story. And from that, provide what I think are some safe generalizations concerning African American humanists and atheists that you might want to know. And then after that, we'll chat. Deal? Okay. I grew up with a deep connection between the fragile nature of human life and religion. And the fragile nature of human life wasn't simply a spiritual yearning. It wasn't simply a kind of spiritual distortion that threatened eternity. It was also physical weakness. My mother, as a teenager, had rheumatic fever. And two years before I was born, she had open heart surgery, the first of two. And so much of my early years revolved around going to church, but at home wondering, would my mother still be in the house when I woke up in the morning? Or would it mean another trip to the hospital? Right? For me, there was a connection between religiosity and the fragile nature of human life. I kind of held on, even as a small child, to religion because it provided some sort of, sort of stability in a world that seemed so deeply fragile and fractured. When I was about seven years old, my mother and my sister Linda, she's nine years older than me, left my grandfather's Baptist church in another town and joined an independent congregation about a block and a half from our home. And I used to go on with them on occasion, and when I was about seven years old, there was a, a change. I stopped playing the game with the hymnal, think of a number, open it up, <laughs> is that the page? <laughs> and I, I still took naps in church, and one particular Sunday I woke up as the doors of the church were being opened. The sermon had been given, and this was the opportunity to bring people to Christ. And the preacher was extending his hand. Doors of the church are open. If there are sinners here who want to get right with the Lord and earn, earn eternal life, now is the time. I got up and I walked to the front. And I think in part I did it because my sister a couple of weeks earlier had done it. And I'm going to let my sister outdo me. She may be older, but if she did it, I'm going to do it. Right? It just made sense to me. She did it, I'm going to do it. Now I'm a part of the church. Sunday school was a part of the traditional Sunday morning process. And our Sunday school classes were taught by the pastor, Reverend Hudson, in his office. We sat in a circle and he'd go through the lesson book and his lesson book contained images that looked nothing like us. Children with dilemmas that were nothing like ours. Using terminology that we certainly didn't use, but he did his best to try to make it fit. And on this particular Sunday, he went around the room and said, now I want to know what you want to do when you grow up. What do you want to be when you grow up? And he got to me and said, what do you want to be, Tony, when you grow up? And I looked at him and said, I'm going to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And word got around, my mother found out, everybody, little Tony's going to be a preacher. He looks like one, right? He looks like one. Little <laughs> Tony's going to be a preacher. He's going to be a preacher. He looks like one, right? But that, man, I'm, I'm seven, eight years old. Looked like a preacher, though. I was fairly clean, cut, like the crease in my pants. Stayed out of trouble in public anyway, kind of saved my... And saved my problems and saved my dirt for home and didn't embarrass my mother in public and tended to be rather polite. He looks like a preacher. And Reverend Hudson took me up on this. He said, okay, you want to be a preacher? You meet me in my office next Sunday. And at that point, he said, well, you're going to start participating. So I became responsible for lining the hymns and leading prayers and opening the doors of the church. This is a big deal. I'm doing these things. I'm on my way to become a preacher, and I'm, I'm looking, right? I'm looking at him to get a sense of the actual look of the preacher. What does a preacher do? How does a preacher conduct himself? How does a preacher speak? Right? I'm taking all of this in. And when I was 12 years old, I preached my first sermon. And so I entered the club. 
I got to see the church in a very different way. I'm developing a theology, and a, a theology that's consistent with my somewhat evangelical and at that point Methodist church. I'm developing this theology that's quite clear. God is real. God created this world. God demands certain things from us. If we don't honor God's request, then we go to hell, period. Period. Most of the things that people might enjoy are wrong. <laughs> Most of what people will enjoy are wrong. That this life is going to be painful, it's going to be hard, but no cross, no crown, it will work out in the end if you persevere. This is what I'm learning. I'm not quite, I'm not quite certain how I came up with this first sermon. I don't quite remember how I came up with that first sermon, but I do remember it. That my mother was so proud that I was going to be a preacher. My grandparents, my mother's parents, extremely proud. My grandfather so proud that he gave me his Bible to use on that Sunday. Mm. That, that was a big deal. That was the Bible that Deacon Hargrave took to church. That's the Bible he used every day for his own devotional. And he was going to let me use it on that Sunday. And so I started preaching. Twelve, I'm preaching. I wasn't bad at it either. Right? I was learning the language, the theology was in line, and the real test of whether one had a calling was what happens after you preach. People were joining the church after I preached. Right? People who knew nothing about the church were coming in, and, and people who were already a part of the church, who were backsliders, were coming asking for forgiveness. It was working out. When I was 18 years old, I was ordained a deacon, which meant I could marry, bury, and baptize people. I'm the youth pastor of a church at that point. I had left Buffalo, New York, which had been my home, and I moved to New York City to go to college. I was following behind the minister who had been the pastor of my church in Buffalo. Now he's in Brooklyn, New York, in Bedford Stuyvesant, and I'm the youth pastor of that church, and I'm going to school. And I'm working this thing, right? I'm working it, and I'm thinking, okay, this makes sense to me. Education was going to have to happen. My grandmother told me, look, she would not go to a doctor without an MD. She would not use an attorney without a JD. And as long as she had breath in her body, her grandson who was going to be a preacher was going to be properly trained. So school was a given. My grandparents were college educated. School was a given. So I'm in school and I'm trying to learn this thing. And I'm going to school and I'm thinking, the Lord is going to help me convert this place. Right? <laughs> I'm taking Columbia for Jesus. It's <laughs> right? I'm, I'm convinced of this because this is my calling. This is what I'm supposed to do. If I'm not bringing people to Christ, what am I doing? <clears throat> and I'm meeting people in school who didn't believe what I believed, didn't believe in a virgin birth. Really didn't believe in the Trinity. Didn't believe that the things I thought were simple were actually sinful. They just thought they were enjoyable and needed to be done in a reasonable and responsible way. But they were good people. You know, they didn't gossip the way some of the folks in the church gossip. They were mean-spirited, like some of the church leaders were mean-spirited. These were good people, people who had my back, who looked out for me. But they had to be going to hell. <laughs> right, because they didn't know Jesus in the free part of their sin, so they had to be going to hell. This was difficult. And the church I'm working at is in Bedford Stuyvesant, and I'm working with young people who are finding it easier to write their eulogies than to project a healthy and Bible life. One of the exercises I used to do in the after school program that I was involved in, in Bedford Stuyvesant, was telling these young people, look, you've got to work on your ability to articulate your ideas. Right? You've got to be able to do this. You've got to be able to think critically, and you've got to be able to communicate these thoughts. So you've got 15 minutes, write whatever you want to write for 15 minutes. Whatever you want to write for 15 minutes, but you've got to write for 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, OK, they're going to write about boyfriends and girlfriends and this sort of thing. And too many of them were writing eulogies. <coughs> writing eulogies. Right? And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a minister in this church. I'm a youth minister. I've got a theology. I'm supposed to be counseling people. I'm supposed to have the answers. I didn't know what to say. The Lord will make a way to seem inadequate. I wasn't certain. What to say to them? 
I had these people in Manhattan who were good, who were kind, who were generous, but they were unsaved. I was learning the theology and how to articulate it and a system of ethics to go along with it that didn't really help me wrestle with these fundamental questions. People were suffering and I didn't have anything that I thought was substantive to say. So I wrestled with this my first year. I wrestled with this my sophomore year. By my junior year, it was becoming extremely difficult to be in that church. I had a commitment. I was going to pastor from my perspective, this was just Satan messing with me. I must be, I must be making progress because because Satan is trying to take my victory. Right? But I'm going to work through this. I knew I was going to work through this, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. I was supposed to be in place for the six o'clock service in Bedford Stuyvesant at my church. Six o'clock service. I'm a college student. I'm supposed to be there on Sunday at six in, in the morning. I have to leave at five to get there at six because I'd have to take the number one to the A train and then I'd have to walk some. It was difficult, but I did it. But it reached a point where it was just too hard. So I get dressed for church. While my roommates are sleeping, I get dressed for church, my suit, my tie on, my, my coat, and I walk like a minister to the train station, and I sit down and I'd let the one pass. And then I'd let another train pass, and I'd let another train pass, and then I'd get on, and I'd make my way to 42nd Street to transfer to the A train, and I'd sit and I'd let a train go by, and I'd let another train go by, and I'd let another train go by, and then I'd get on the train, and I'd get off as boys and girls high school and I'd slowly walk to the church so that by the time I got there I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to be in the pulpit because I was having such a hard time for it. The prayer seemed empty to me. The scripture seemed distant to me. The sermon seemed out of touch but I wanted it to have me. I, I, I just wasn't certain what to do so I'd get there late and I could tell the pastor and doctor the train. The train. I'm sorry. It was the train. It was the train. This was difficult. I began to rethink my theology. I began to rethink my theology because I had to find a way to talk about God and all the things related to God, talk about this stuff in a way that helped me make sense of the world and give people something that can help them change the world. So I'm rethinking my theology. I'm also meeting people in Harlem or saying, this church stuff, that's just bullshit. You know what the problem is? You need to let it go. None of this makes any sense. And I'm thinking, ah, that kind of resistance, I must be on the right path. If I'm just steadfast, I'll get the answer because of all of this resistance. Reason didn't change my thinking. My theology was flexible and fluid. I anticipated, I needed this resistance. I learned very early on, I measure my progress based upon this sort of resistance. Even as a child in school, kid bumped into me in the hallway. He must know I'm a Christian. I must know I'm a Christian. Someone spills something. Must know I'm a Christian. Satan trying to get me. But any kind of resistance, any kind of pushing, I can easily label. Demonic forces trying to get me, right? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, blood, but powers and principalities, right? And they're always in action, always moving and working through people. So any kind of resistance to what I was thinking, I could easily categorize and dismiss. What was really getting me was ethics. I didn't have a way of doing, and doing in a way that made a difference. It wasn't attacks on my theology that mattered at the end of the day for me. It was the inadequacy of my ethics. I didn't have a way to do and do and make a difference. What ought we do was not a question I had a good answer to. For me, it was ethics. And I'm wrestling with this, but I'm still committed. I'm going to be a pastor. I just need a different type of theology. Right? And it's got to be more about the people. And I'm looking for ministerial models on how to think this thing through, how to do this. I'm looking for models of how to do this. I had to hold on to God because God was real. The problem was with us. So I'm trying to work this. I'm trying to work this. And I'm remembering what my grandmother said, so I still have to go to school. I finished undergrad, and the next step is divinity school. I needed the professional degree for ministry. And I wanted to go to a place 
where my ideas would be challenged. I, I, I wanted that kind of challenge. I, I wanted to be in a place where religion was taken seriously, but where it was challenged. I, I really hadn't gotten that as a high school student. I had transferred from a public school to West Seneca Christian School. It was a theater for Bob Jones University, enough said. <laughs> Columbia, you take whatever you want. I was a sociology major. I needed this sort of challenge from folks who took religion seriously. So I decided Harvard Divinity School was going to be the place for me. Right? In part, I knew because when I started talking to people about my options, where I thought I might want to go, and I got to Harvard Divinity School, people come on. <laughs> Don't let them take your Jesus. <laughs> Deeply worried, you know what I mean? Deeply worried. And I thought, well, this is probably the place. <laughs> <laughs> look at challenges that take place here. Right? They don't necessarily think what I think, and that's going to be important to me. I, I need that sort of challenge, so I went. And there was that sort of challenge. I did my field work. Right? You had to work in a church setting, so I picked the church in Roxbury, in an economically challenged area of town. That's where I wanted to do my work, to see if I could come up with something that would be significant and that would transform lives. I decided to work in Roxbury at a church that was across the street from a park. And this park was a challenge. I, I bet in its day it was a beautiful park, but when I arrived, it wasn't so beautiful. Life was disregarded. Drug deals were taking place. Prostitution was the trade of the day, it was difficult. And this church had very little to say. I'm dealing with young people, because again, I'm the youth pastor. Right? I'm the youth pastor at this church. I had experience doing this. I had been in Brooklyn. I'm the youth pastor. And we are having funerals for 16 and 17 year olds. Mm. I'm, I'm wanting to take these kids on field trips, and they're telling me, Rev, no, we can't go over there. Blue Hill, we can't go over there. Mm. Right, no, we cannot ride through Blue Hill. I'm like, why can't you ride through Blue Hill? It's rival gang territory. No, we just can't do that. It was difficult. And, and I didn't really have people to talk with because I'm the youth pastor. I'm supposed to have the answers, not the questions. Right? I'm supposed to answer questions. And so I didn't have anyone to talk to. And so I'm, I'm praying about this. I've got to figure out a way to make this thing Work. I have to have something to say that is meaningful. And the pastor is telling me, Penn, when you preach, let the people get happy with you. <coughs> I get in that booth. I get lively. Move around. Get loud. Let the people get happy with you. You owe them that much. The week is hard. You've got to give them something that will energize them and keep them moving. Let the people get happy with you. That wasn't me. I, I wasn't happy. I'm trying to figure this thing out, and it's not working for me. I, I finished the MDF program, and I move into the PhD program, and this is intensified. I'm, I'm wrestling with this. I've, I've changed my notion of God. I've modified it, but it still is inadequate. And I reach a point in the PhD program where I say enough is enough. That if it's really about the people, I've got to be willing to sacrifice everything that does not benefit those in need. And for me, it reached the point where I had to say, none of this is real. God does not exist. It's just us. Now what do we do? <laughs> so I contacted the pastor and said I wouldn't be coming back. That I, I didn't believe. That there were lots of things I was willing to be, but I was not going to be a hypocrite. I was not going to stand in this pulpit and preach what I did not believe. I contacted my bishop and said I wanted to surrender my ordination. At that point, I was an elder. I got to marry, very baptized, and consecrate the communion elements. That's a big deal. <laughs> so I told him, you, I, I surrender my ordination. I, I just, I, I can't do this. I, I can't do it. God does not exist. It's just us. We've got to rethink our ethics in a way that reflects that. We've got to be bold and mature enough to stand on our own and do what we can do. Because we're alone here. So I left the church. But I stayed with religion. I, I, I wanted to study religion. It's a cultural development that has had profound 
impact. There's nothing mysterious behind it. It has no power. It's a human effort to make meaning out of life. It's a cultural reality, and I still wanted to study it. So I got my first job at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. I hadn't been there long before one of the reporters contacted me and said, look, we'd like to do a profile. And I'm thinking this means absolutely nothing. It's the Saturday paper. No one's going to read this. And so we're just chatting. Right? We're having a good time chatting. And in this conversation, it came out that I'm an atheist teaching religious studies. Uh, who really cares? <laughs> who really cares? It was amazing. Right? Because I thought Minnesotans were nice. This is what I had been <laughs> Any Minnesotans here, you lied to me. I was <laughs> They're nice. But the hate mail. Wow. phone calls, students telling me that their parents said they shouldn't take classes with me anymore, trustees having questions concerning fit. Right? It was just nasty. But then I heard from some people who said, good for you. Anything we need to do to help you, you let us know and we're there for you. But these Minnesotans were vicious. <laughs> they were vicious. But I made a decision that there was... <coughs> The Bible was literature, and I preferred Richard Wright to Paul. And God did not exist. God was a human construction that spoke to our weakness and our passivity as opposed to taking seriously our capacity and our limitations, that this did not work. There was nothing real behind this. There was just us. And we needed to develop a system of ethics that allowed us to be the best us we could be. So that's my story, and I think there are some generalizations that can come out of this if we're actually interested in representing the diversity of perspectives and opinions in our movements. First order of business, know something about us. Ask us about our stories. Ask us about our stories. Two, recognize that it's not one size fits all. People come into this for a variety of reasons, from a variety of perspectives, and how we approach, how we provide information has to reflect that diversity. It isn't one size fits all. A variety of approaches is the way we need to go about our business. That is important. Know something about us. Ask us about our stories. Recognize that how we go about doing this work, how we go about addressing humanism, atheism, it needs to be as layered and complex as the people we're interested in addressing. You could say that, Pen, well, you could have left the church a long time ago. As soon as you had the questions, why didn't you get your ass out? Well, it gave me something. Right? It gave me something. The theology was hard for me. It wasn't making sense. The rituals seemed rather odd, strange, and disconnected from reality, but it gave me community. It gave me people, relationships, and a larger world that seemed incredibly screwed up. It gave some piece of stability. And I was willing to overlook the, trouble, the problematic elements in order to get those relationships. These, these relationships were important. There was a kind of cultural richness for me. Relationships, community, and, and that was worth the price of the ticket. I'd give my 10%. I would listen to the sermons. I try to make sense of this because I had human <coughs> connections. Seems to me if we're going to advance, if we're going to grow, then we have to replace that. You ask people to leave these institutions, give them something. And you've got to give them something beyond the critiques of what they're leaving. Right? It's bullshit, okay. <laughs> but give them something. Right? Help them develop. Relationships, community, and then the term that we don't really like, ritual structures. Right? And by ritual, I simply mean this. Repeated activities and founded spaces. Repeated activities and founded spaces. The AHA conference is a ritual. This is a ritual. American atheists will meet not too far from here. These are rituals. 
repeated activity and found its space. There's nothing supernatural about this of necessity. It's just people kind of recognizing the strength of their connection, recognizing that they occupy time and space, and that occupation of time and space is important. Ritual structures that help folks recognize the value of their humanity. We need to give people these things. I also think that we often surrender too quickly certain elements of human relationship to the people, much too quickly, much too quickly, simply because they had these things. Right? It seems to me ritual is one of these. We surrender it so quickly because they had this stuff, and if they had it, it's so hopelessly tainted that it cannot be rescued. It seems to me that if we're going to develop community, if we're going to develop relationships that draw people in, that give them something when they're leaving the churches, I'm familiar with, if they're leading you to give them something that replaces this, it, it requires a kind of complex thinking. And it seems to me, at least with respect to African American humanists and atheists, it might require doing a little spying on these churches. <laughs> the theology makes absolutely no sense. The rituals are bizarre. Right? God could be replaced by Santa Claus and nothing would be lost. I get it. <laughs> but they're keeping people. And they're keeping people who say they don't believe any of this stuff. They're saying, it's, what is it that these churches are offering that keep people that should be with us? That requires a little legwork. Seems to me worthwhile. I'm a member of a long, robust, and proud community, African American humanists and atheists, who go back to the very presence of stolen African bodies. We've been here a long time. We ought to be part of the larger narrative, and to make that happen will require a whole lot of work. Thank you. get that same reaction at Rice? No. Why not? A couple of things. One, McAllister has a religious affiliation. Presbyterian still, I assume. Yes, I wasn't going to name it. I was just going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Rice is and has always been secular. Right? And so lots of people will ask me, why is it? Teaching religion, what the hell? Why are you doing that? Right? And it seems to me in part because people are confusing church and university. Right? The church has an obligation to proselytize. It's about the business of developing disciples. I'm in a tier one research university. The idea is to develop critical thinkers who know something about the cultural arrangements that determine our world. They have the ability to transform those arrangements in productive ways. That's what I do. And it seems to me, in order to transform these cultural arrangements, you have to have a sense of one of the more powerful cultural markers, religion. Plus you're more of a badass. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I liked you for a lot of people. <laughs> that go beyond the shared hairdo. <laughs> you're my buddy, I like you. <laughs> but yeah, it was, so there was that kind of a religious affiliation at McAllister. And, and there was an agreement that I didn't abide by, right? I mean, that my experience of Minnesotans was that many of them are deeply passive aggressive. <laughs> it's a certain way conversations take place. Right, so I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said something off color to me and then followed up with, I'm only kidding. <laughs> right? I can't respond at that point because then if I respond, I'm the ass. <laughs> yeah? 
But it plays out this way. No one invited me over for Ludacris. No one. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then I get hot dish, but no one the best friend. Hot dish. But yeah, so with McAllister, you have this religious affiliation that's very present on the campus. Yeah, very present on the campus. And you have someone who's not abiding by the rules of engagement as they have been laid out. Never told to me directly, but as they were laid out. And an assumption, again, that there's little distinction between a religion department and Sunday school. Right? So this guy is teaching religious studies. He better be a Christian, or we can even accept it if he's Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, but an atheist, what the hell? This makes no sense to them. Did they have mandatory chapel when you were no. there? No. Oh, no, they did when I was long gone. Long, 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 long gone. You're old, Al. <laughs> Right here. Hi, Dr. 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 Ben. Um, I wanted to try to answer your question about what we would give the community. A little if, louder, please. Let's get, let's get louder. Okay. Um, I wanted to try to answer your question on, about what we would give them to, to give them something. And so, of course, um, I do not have the same experiences as you. Um, and so, I, if this question is mostly to see how the African-American community, or even um, David's Hispanic community, um, would respond um, to what we gave. Um, so if, if what we gave was based on a condition, if we said, um, in exchange um, for you giving up uh, the mental slavery of superstition, driven by the primitive tactics of fear, coercion, guilt, peer pressure, violence, uh, discrimination, um, if you are willing to do that, then what we would give you is uh, the inner peace of wisdom that comes, that's granted by the hard work of education, evidence, logic, reason, equanimity, meditation. How would um, either the Hispanic community or the African American community respond to that? Because I know religion gives a tremendous amount of power, privilege, and fellowship uh, how, how would they respond? I, I, I'd say a couple of things on that. One, what becomes extremely important is avoiding the posture and the tone of the great white hope, right? We are going to give you something that is going to transform. I'm saying we already exist. Acknowledge that, right? I'm, I'm talking about inclusion, not providing us with something we don't already have. We've got a long history of thinking way of behaving accordingly. So you're not really giving us anything. Secondly, I would say, you know, the, the number of African Americans who are unaffiliated and public about it has grown. Yeah? So it seems to me the first order of business isn't really stealing the members from East Cupcake Baptist Church. It's providing something for the folks who say, this stuff makes no sense to me. I need something else. Lots of them are public. So it seems to me, this is the first order of business. The African Americans who say, I need something else. What do you provide? Without the assumption that we are giving you knowledge and information that you did not have. We are <coughs> civilizing you. I was raised in quite the opposite that you were. I was raised in a family with no religion whatsoever. And the only time I ever went to church was to volunteer, honestly, and I never told people there that I wasn't religious. I'd just show up with my friends to do my volunteer hours and things like that. And I always asked my mom why there wasn't a place for us where we could go meet people, have community, and be able to volunteer and give back to our community without it being religious. Because I feel like there's so much more that you can do for the people around you, and it doesn't have to do with God. And I want to know how I would go about raising my children in a way where I could make them feel included in the community without it forcing them to have to go to a church to do that. I don't know that I can answer that question for you. Yeah, and yet, like ideas yeah. of like, I mean, getting involved. Well, it seems to me that organizations within our movement, again, might take a page out of the handbook used by churches. And when I was in church ministry, it was quite clear, and we were told this, Provide a service, the rest will follow. 
right, that provide a service. So my job as youth minister really wasn't to pound theology at folks, it was to provide them with outlets. So first order business for me was after school tutoring programs, basketball teams, right? Provide the kids with something and the parents flock to the church because we were giving them something, trying to make a difference in their lives without slapping them with theology. It seems to me that if we are really interested in that form of ethics, then first order of business ought to be doing. Line up with organizations within these communities that have a sense of what these communities need and meet those needs. It also seems to me that it becomes extremely important for us to have benchmarks of success. Right? And we have to ask ourselves, what is an acceptable level of discomfort during this process? Right? What is an acceptable level of discomfort in this process? As we work to do this thing, how comfortable with, are you with me saying things this at you from time to time? Because you get What's your level of comfort with this comfort? Yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, in Dallas, we have organizations like the Fellowship of Free Thought and North Texas Church of Free Thought and other atheist and humanist groups that uh, I, I don't know what their structure is like because I haven't really been uh, to their meetings that much. But uh, with FOF and NTCUF, um, it's kind of like church without the mumbo jumbo, without the supernatural. Um, we have fellowship, we have volunteer opportunities galore and uh, especially with FOF and uh, so that's that's what we've that's what we've uh, founded here in Dallas and it seems to work very well for us uh, I'm not from Minnesota <laughs> uh, actually I'm a member of the strict free thought I haven't been there in years so I guess Back, backsliding and have been a good atheist. <laughs> uh, a couple of things. Do we really need to? Are there aren't there other secular things that even Christians and others do, like uh, uh, you know, caste society, the uh, other things that people do socially to get together for like the Juana's Club, the Lions Club, those kinds of things. Do they, do we have to have a a a mirror version of what they have to offer them? Or is it really is it really even necessary? I I'd say a couple of things. One, I'm not saying any of this has to happen, right? You may be content with the look of the movement, and if you are, that's fine, right? I'm not saying any of this needs to happen, but I'm asked too often, how do we diversify, right? So my attitude is, we need to do something. Does it need to mirror these existing organizations and what they offer? I'm not convinced that it does, but we need to offer something, right? And, and what I do is, I, I'm an academic who's paid to raise questions and to probe. So I don't have these structures for you, but I do think I have a damn good set of questions for you to wrestle with. Um, I'm the outreach director for uh, Fellowship of Free Thought, actually, and one of the things that I run into is that a lot of these big churches have the infrastructure for outreaching to communities, and um, because our groups are, we're, we're trying to build an infrastructure um, in, in here in Dallas and in the Metroplex, but we don't have everything in place yet. So uh, one big dilemma that I have is, what about joint ventures with churches um, and, and things? You know, what what do I do if um, you know? It's like I don't really want to work with this organization, but there are um, you know people that might miss out on on a particular outreach education uh, activity. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. I have Thank absolutely you. no problem with that. Right? Because, uh, again, my, my thinking is this. Um, religion may be dying, but it's not dead yet. Right? And, and you also have to kind of think about 
that question of whether or not religion is dying in light of areas of population growth. Let's think about this globally, right? Let's think about areas of population growth that with the question of whether religion is dying or not, Nigeria may be more important than the Netherlands, yeah? So if we look at areas where there is significant population growth, I'm not quite convinced that at this stage religion is dying. It's transforming in the low-hanging fruit. The more easily identified craft may be going away, but it mutates. It transforms. So the question for me as an atheist is this. How do we do the good work, right? How do we push for a more reasonable world in, a, in societies where religion still lives? Right? How do we do this sort of work? How do we push for a more reasonable world in societies where religion still lives? And from my perspective, that often requires partnerships. Right? Working with those who we can work with. Uh, I was really interested in your story. Um, so this is kind of a personal question uh, to some extent, but I. I personally kind of related to some of it. Um, grew up in a really religious home. Um, fascinated with religion from the standpoint of literature. Um, decided to pursue uh, in the middle of a doctoral program right now looking at the Harlem Renaissance. But um, left Christianity about a year ago um, under circumstances that are somewhat similar. Um, but I'm just wondering like, that period where you came out and you said that you couldn't do this anymore and you walked away from it, uh, what's your personal attitude was? Were you very, uh, was it more of a downer for you or were you more like... Was it more of a what? A downer? Was it more of something very depressing for you to go through or was it in a way somewhat exciting as far as, okay, now I can, you know, get down and, you know, do work without having to... Um, always give deference to God and do that more openly. Like, what was your what was your attitude? Because you're talking a lot about um, you're talking a lot about trying to give people give African Americans something to replace religion. Give people what they need. Yeah, give people what they need. So, yeah. what 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 was your attitude? Did yeah. you feel like you had what you needed after yeah, you well, left her? For me, it was a necessity, and I felt like I could finally breathe. That for such a long time, I'd been holding my breath. And I could finally breathe. And I was willing to lose people in the process. I lost lots of friends as a result of that decision. But I had always been taught that your integrity was important. My grandmother told me, and she told this to all of her grandchildren when they were going off to college. Move through the world knowing your footsteps matter. Now we have a certain type of accountability and responsibility. I had to maintain my integrity. Of necessity, I had to let this go. And I was willing to lose people who couldn't go with me. That was fine. Right? So I lost friends. I, I, members of my family thought, okay, what happened to him? He must have asked the Lord for something and didn't get it. Right? So I family members. <laughs> but my mother told me, look. You know, we disagree on this, and I'm hoping you'll come back, but whether you come back or not, you're my son, and I love you to life, right? So, some people were with me, some people weren't, but I could breathe, because I was being true to what I thought, and that was sufficient. Hi, Professor. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was wondering when you were talking about, um, as in respect to the African American culture and atheism and humanism and as to, uh, um, us acknowledging it, is that what I heard correctly? Is it, for me, um, when I talk, when I think about the age of reason, part of my struggle is not to see those differences between men and women and color and things like that. So am I, is that the wrong approach, perhaps, maybe? For me it is. Right, because my argument is this, we don't have to deny difference, right, we don't have to deny difference, what we have to do is remove the sort of charge that difference has, right, but I, we don't have to get rid of 
difference. We can't, we don't need to render everything the same. My fear is in rendering everything the same, what we end up with is a rather Eurocentric perspective on the world. Because everybody's not going to shift in my way of seeing things. <laughs> right? So, no, I, I don't like that at all. It's a matter of recognizing difference, not as a problem to solve, but as a benefit. And, and some of these things just have to be kept in mind. So, <clears throat> most of the, I won't say all, but I'll say most of the humanists and atheists, I mean, are fans of the Enlightenment. Right? To kind of think about modernity, and particularly this enlightenment phase, as being tremendously wonderful. But as an African American, I understand my people as having been the underbelly of, of the enlightenment. Right? That people of African descent are constructed in a particularly tragic and horrific way as a result of modernity. Right? There are no Negroes prior to modernity. And the enlightenment further dehumanized African Americans, yeah? And so it seems to me there are ways in which African Americans embrace humanism and atheism as a critique of the more despicable elements of enlightenment. But I think this is something you, you folks need to recognize. So when you're, when you're, you know, in enlightenment, think about how some of us understand the enlightenment. Uh, last question over there. Can we do two more? All right, sure. Dr. Anderson, as well. Okay. I, I probably have a short one here. Uh, a number of us are going around and trying to build organizations, provide services like you're talking about, mm -hmm. and we come in contact with a lot of the uh, traditional religious organizations. Mm -hmm. And the more I read and talk to ministers, the more I become aware that there are quite a few ministers who just love to get out, but love to do all the things that they're doing, providing services to the community. And that's pretty neat. I just, I, I'm just wishing that there was some sort of an organization that we already had in place with buildings and all the infrastructure. So we'd say, yeah, come on over, we'll pay you. Uh, I think there's a lot of ministers who would really like to leave the ministry if we could find out a way to support them and afford them. Do you have any ideas on that? I... How to... <laughs> We don't have much money. <laughs> how to support them, how to bring them out and keep them financially viable. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> it's I'm really sad. That... Saying, I don't know when I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, frustrating to see that there's an opportunity there and a desire and a need on our part, and we can't seem to get the two of them together. I, personally, I would be more concerned with the people than the pulpit. Right, I, I wouldn't personally be spending a lot of time trying to bring ministers out. I think ministers have a certain type of privilege and position that might, in fact, make it easier for them. And they have a certain type of skill set. I'm, I'm much more concerned with the people in the pew who have fewer options, a different type of visibility and standing. Much more difficult for them. Doctor?
movement, communist, socialist, um, you know, dealing with issues of the ratification, um, <coughs> issues of um, unequal pay and horrible working conditions. But the fact of the matter was that there was still that center of white supremacy within the labor movement. So they had to disengage. That's what really propelled A. Bill Randolph to found the Brothers of the Speech of Our Court. So we see an analogy here in the so-called post-racial, colorblind 21st century with the institutionalization of the black church and other organizations that serve people of color on multiple levels, not just dealing with church-state separation and all of the issues that the white-dominated secular movement can have the privilege to fix that on. <laughs> all right, that's that's all the time we've got. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr.